Hi, my name's Eric Haynes. I'm with NVIDIA, and this talk is about ray tracing effects. It's got all the eye candy you would ever want. I like to start with a quote, and I promise I won't try to sing it. This is from Queen, and it's from Bohemian Rhapsody. Is this the real life? Is this just fantasy? And I like to say that because which one is real of these two images? One is a photo, and one is a simulation. It turns out the one on the left is the photo, and the one on the right is the simulation. This is the famous Cornell box. The Cornell box was actually made in 1984, I believe. I was actually at the lab at the time, in fact, though not part of that group. And it was pretty funny because Don Greenberg comes in and he goes, OK, guys, we're going to make a box. And they're like, yeah, sure, I can do that with uh, you know, a little computer graphic. He's like, no, no, we're going to get some plywood, and you're going to get some paint. And they were all like, Whoa, what are we doing? But eventually, the, you know, they got with the program, and uh, the rest is history. So with the Cornell box, what you can do is start with a really simplified system and look at the various effects. So we're going to start with just hard shadows here. And so instead of an area light source overhead, we have just a point light source, a single point where light's emitting. You can see that what you get is these very sharp shadows. And a sharp shadow is just going from some intersection point, some point we're looking at, to the light. And some of those will be blocked, and those are in shadows, and some are illuminated. If you want soft shadows, you have to go with an area light where you're sampling on various points on the light. So this is that more stochastic ray tracing kind of a feel, where you're shooting a bunch of rays, and you're figuring out what percentage of the light you see. If you're fully in light, great. If you're partially in light, that's called the penumbra, and that's where the soft shadow is. Or if every ray is blocked, then you're in the umbra, the full shadow area. The next step is to start bouncing that light around, to let the light percolate through the environment. So instead of just looking directly at the light, we're going to have light that bounces around. This is called by a lot of different names. There's interreflection, because the light's reflecting off of a bunch of surfaces, or indirect lighting, or color bleeding, which is sort of specifically where color comes off of one wall and illuminates something else. And they all have this group term called global illumination. So in this case, we can see a ray is going from the floor, where there's a green spot, and it hits the wall, and it goes to the light. There are, in fact, tons of paths. This is one of many, many paths that could hit the wall and go towards the light. And all of them contribute a green color to that floor area. In that last scene, everything was diffuse, matte. Didn't really have any kind of reflection to it. You can also go with glossy reflections, where, again, you're doing a stochastic kind of process where you're shooting a ray in a burst, like you're shooting a burst of rays from your reflective surface. And that gives you this fuzzy, softer reflection in it. So those are a bunch of different kinds of effects. And here's another example of glossy reflection. It's very shiny on the left and goes to more and more rough as we go to the right. So here's your quiz question. This image has a number of effects in it. Which effects that we've talked about do you see in this image? The three that I see are there's glossy reflections on the ceiling and on the floor and on the wall to the right. There's interreflection throughout. And there's soft shadows. And I especially want to note the inner reflection throughout. The point of this is that if you were to just have this scene lit by just the sun, you would only have a few small portions of the interior that would actually get any light at all. The rest of the interior would just be entirely dark. So by having this light bouncing around the interior, we get a realistic look to things. There are other operations you can do with ray tracing where it's not particularly physically based, but it's physically plausible. So this is called ambient occlusion, where there's no particular light source in this scene. But what we're doing is we're shooting out little bursts of rays from every location in the scene and trying to see if things are in crevices or could be occluded by other objects. So let's look at that scooter in particular. With ambient occlusion, what you do is you take a point, and you shoot out a burst of rays, and you shoot them a certain distance. You may shoot them, say, three feet or whatever scale makes sense for your scene. If a bunch of rays hit something, like underneath the scooter or the tire or whatever, then we can say that, well, this area is kind of dark. Like, odds are that if a light were to be shown upon this scooter, that area would be in shadow. On the other hand, if you're out in the open, you have a burst of rays, and almost all the rays get to that maximum distance, like three feet or whatever it is. And maybe a ray or two hits something. But overall, you're kind of in the light, and you can see it all. So that area gets no shadow at all. So notice that it's a term that's not physical, in that if you actually shone a light underneath the scooter, it would still look dark using ambient occlusion. But it's a really good approximation of how crevices darken up and so on. And so it's commonly used in games. And it's been used in rasterization for a long time. But with ray tracing, you can get a, a better answer, basically. 
Another cool thing you can do with ray tracing is depth of field. You can get a background blur, as in this shot, or you can get a foreground blur, or you can get foreground and background blurs, for that matter. The idea is that by using depth of field, it's a very cinematic effect, and you can lead the user's eye to whatever point you want to focus on, so the character on the right in this case. The other thing you can do is motion blur. Instead of varying where the rays go, what you're doing is varying where the model is in time, and you just kind of add up the rays at various points during the frame, and you get this blurry effect. And again, this is a cinematic effect, and it's actually quite important to have in games or films, because what you want to do is you want to sort of not have this kind of stroboscopic effect, where if you just had a single flat frame with very sharp edges and so on, it animates as if someone's flashing a strobe light on the scene. Uh, this could actually be used in various films, like Gladiator, for effect, but generally it's not the effect you want. And when the film is actually running, you don't tend to see this motion blur so much, it just looks natural. You can also do atmospheric effects. So if you have, say, a beam of light, you can do a thing called ray marching, where the ray hits the beam and marches through it, and it looks at light scattering in and light scattering out and so on, and you just kind of walk through that thing and sample it as you go, and you can get these nice beams of light, god ray kinds of effects. So I'm gonna just show this short clip from Minecraft RTX, a demo we're making in conjunction with Microsoft of bringing ray tracing to Minecraft. And I'll just leave it as sort of a quiz question for you as to figure out which effects are happening in this little demo. One last effect I want to talk about is caustics, which sounds dangerous. It sounds like acid or something, and they are dangerous, and, and not because of the octopus in the picture here. What caustics are is the reflection of light off the surface of water or refraction of the light through water or through glass or through other transparent media. So here we have light reflecting off the water, and you can see it underneath and above. In this next picture, you can see beams of light and you can see the caustics on the ground underwater. And this is a little clip from the Justice demo, which shows how these caustics are underneath the bridge and how they really sort of bring that area to life. It gives it a real vibrancy. Now, as far as the danger of caustics, it's a real life danger. So this is a picture of my office. And on my windowsill, like a lot of computer graphics people, I have little tchotchkes of different cool materials and things I can stare at. One of them was this little crystal ball on a wooden platform. And if you zoom in on that crystal ball, you'll see, oh, gee, there's, there's funny little marks on the wooden platform. And I hadn't realized this for quite a while. I was once in one office, then I moved to another office, and you can see the effect. There are these burn marks in two different areas, and it just depended on which way the ball was facing. And luckily, I did not burn down our office. That would not have been so good. But anyway, this, this is actually a real problem. Like, people will, if you Google it, you'll find someone has their house uh, can, can light on fire due to snow globes. So beware of caustics. So I like to keep my caustics virtual. I like to keep them in the computer graphics world. And so these are just two shots from the physical base renderer by uh, Matt Farr and others. And it gives these gorgeous effects of light refracting through these various glass and so on surfaces. And that's it. For further resources, see the link for all kinds of free books and whatnot. And one free book in particular I like to point out is Ray Tracing Gems, which is a modern book about ray tracing theory and practice and is free to download.